What a profoundly strange moment in history when a man stripped and beaten and nailed to a cross is still the son of God. It was God hanging on the cross, the second person of the Trinity, fully divine, so he was big enough to pay for our sins, but fully human, so he could do it in our place and feel what we would have felt and experience what we would have experienced. And understand this, when it came to the cross and Jesus going to the cross, Jesus was fully aware of what was happening. Jesus knew exactly what was going on. He wasn't confused. He wasn't a pawn in some strange political or religious game. And through history, people have sort of debated and discussed um, what was going on at that moment on the cross. What, how did Jesus end up? If Jesus was God who came in human flesh, how did he end up on the cross? And some people would say things like this. Some people would say, well, it was the... It was the, the, the Roman government and their political power that put Jesus on the cross. But I will stand here and tell you this night, it was not the power of the Roman Empire that put Jesus on the cross because they didn't have the power to do that, even though they thought they did. And it was not the Jewish religious establishment, even though it might have looked like that. They were the ones that put on the trials they were the ones that made the accusations that Jesus had blasphemed and they, they're the ones that made all of the spiritual accusations. Was it, was it them that put Jesus on the cross? And the answer is no. I've heard people say, well, what put Jesus on the cross was our sins. But can I tell you something? Our sins, as bad as they are, don't have the power to put Jesus on the cross. Some people will say it was the devil and the power of the enemy. But let me tell you, the enemy has no power over Jesus. And so listen to these words. Listen to these words from John chapter 19. Jesus is before Pilate. Pilate who thinks he has control over what's happening. And in John 19 verse 10 we read these words. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said, the governor said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Pilate believed that. He believed he, had, believed he had power over Jesus' life or death. Do you not realize that I have power either to free you or crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. What a response. Who put Jesus on the cross? If it wasn't the Romans and their political power, if it wasn't the Jews and their re twisted religious establishment, if it wasn't our sins and if it wasn't the power of Satan, who put Jesus on the cross? And here's the answer. Jesus. Jesus chose to go to the cross and die. And you might wonder, why? And here's what you need to understand tonight. If you're wondering, well, why would Jesus allow himself, choose to go to the cross? And the answer is very simple. You. And you. In you. He knew you. He knew every sin you would commit, every rebellion of your heart, every dark thing that you wish you had never thought, done, or said. And he knew the only way to wash it away was to pay the price with his own life and his own blood on the cross. So he chose to go to the cross. And no one put him there except for himself. He chose to give his life for you. And along with that, we have to understand that Jesus could have stopped this at any time. At any time, at any moment in this whole process, in this whole drama unfolding where it looks like, it looks like the, the political leaders are doing this and the religious leaders are doing this and the power of hell is doing this and all these forces are at work. And you think, well, Jesus is just some helpless, you know, helpless you know, little sailboat being blown by the wind, wherever the winds of things are. No, that's not what was happening here. As a matter of fact, when, when, when Jesus is in the garden, before he's going to go to the cross, and this little crowd comes with some Roman soldiers and Judas to betray Jesus with a kiss, and, and they, they come into the garden to, to arrest Jesus. And Peter sees what's going on, and Peter pulls out a sword. He lashes out and slashes someone's ear off. Turns out it's the servant of the high priest. We even know the servant's name it was Malchus. We can read the Gospels and see what happened. And so Peter lashes out to defend Jesus. 
Read the Gospels. When this happens, you know what Jesus does? He reaches over, touches the man whose ear that Peter just cut off, touches, and heals it. And he says something to Peter, and he says something for us to understand. In Matthew 26, 53, Jesus says, Do you think I cannot call on my Father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. But, not now, but how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say this might happen, this must happen in this way? Jesus says, Peter, don't you understand? I could call down the angels of heaven. A legion, a Roman legion, was 6,500 people. It's a lot of people. A Roman legion was 6,500 people. Now, 5,500 of those were soldiers. You say, well, why is there 6,500? If you're a soldier, you know why. Because there's cooks, and there's people that carry the weapons, and there's a medical team. A legion had, it was an entire, like a small town that would travel in battle. So there's 5,500 soldiers in the legion, and Jesus says, I could call my father, and he would send down a dozen legion, or more than a dozen. That would be 66,000, in a Roman legion terms, 66,000 soldiers. So here's what Jesus says. Here Peter is, he's going to defend Jesus because this crowd of 20, 30, 40 people have come to catch him. And Jesus says, don't you understand? I can say two words and flip the script here. Here's the words. Father, angels. And more than 66,000 angels. Now the point is not the number, is it? Jesus is painting a picture. Don't you understand? If one angel, one heavenly warrior would have shown up in that garden... Every one of those people in that crowd that came to arrest Jesus would have fallen on their faces in terror at the sight of one angel. Jesus says, don't you understand? I could just say, Father, angels, and this would be over. This would be done. At any moment, Jesus only had to say, I'm done with this. These people aren't worth it. He's not worth it. She's not worth it. The one who's going to drive the nails through my hand, they're not worth it. But he didn't. And as a matter of fact, when his own people started to defend him, he said, no. This is the route I've chosen. Why? Why? He knew your sins. He knew your failings. He knew everything about you. And he knew the only way to wash you clean and to wash me clean was to give his life in our place. So he said no to the legions of angels and yes to a cross to pay the price for us and our sins. Jesus laid down his own life. No one took it from him. Nobody could. If you listen to these words from John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, you see that even long before Jesus went to the cross, he declared the truth of his own power as God among us, as Emmanuel. In John 10, 17, we read these words. Jesus is speaking and he says, the reason my father loves me is that I lay my life, I lay down my life only to take it up again. Jesus says, I have the power to offer my life. I have the power to take it up. Nobody else has that power. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. That's the resurrection, folks. That comes on Sunday. Please join us and celebrate with us. But right now we're remembering this moment when he chose not to take the road of deliverance, but the road of sacrifice. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. Jesus went to the cross. It wasn't political manipulation. It wasn't religious control. It wasn't the badness of our sins. It wasn't the power of hell because none of those had power over Jesus. It was a choice he made to set us free, to take our place, to be broken, to make us whole. That's why Jesus went to the cross. And the only one who had the power to say yes to Jesus going to the cross was Jesus himself because only he could lay his life down and only he could take it up again. I hope you know that tonight. And when you recognize what he did on the cross, don't let it stay impersonal. Take it very personally. Because it was my sins and your sins that he chose to give his life to pay the price for. Jesus took it personally, so we should take it personally. And in a little bit when we 
partake of the bread and partake of the cup and remember that his body was broken and his blood was shed. Remember that it was for you. He knew you. He knew your sins. He knew all of your needs and he gave his life for you. And so often when we come to Good Friday, so often we think about the cross and what Jesus bore on the cross. We focus almost exclusively on the physical torment. But I want to share with you tonight that there was a lot more going on. There was, there was absolute physical brutality and torment that Jesus took so that we wouldn't have to. But there was also emotional turmoil and torment. And there was spiritual torment. And as we get ready to come to the table, I want you to recognize all that Jesus was doing when he came to the cross for us. And so first we think about the physical, the part that's obvious to see. Jesus willingly suffered physical torture. And the cross was designed to be torture. It was not designed to be a, a simple execution. It was, it was designed to last as long as it could and linger and create torture and, and, and public embarrassment. Jesus willingly suffered physical torture. He was broken to offer you and me healing. If you walk through the Gospel of John, the 19th chapter, you see this, this story unfold in John 19. In, in verse 1 of John 19, we see Jesus is flogged. He's beaten. This was the Romans' way of taking somebody with, within an inch of their life, but not killing them. So they would, they would bring this whip down upon the person's back 39 times because 40 would kill a person. They flogged him. And then in verse two, we, we find out that the guards are gonna have a little bit of fun with Jesus now. So they, they thrust this crown of thorns on his head and they begin to mock him. And verse three, the Lord of glory is slapped across the face over and over as they continue to mock him. In verse 17 of John 19, we see them put the cross beam of the cross on Jesus' shoulders and force him to climb up the hill called the Hill of the Skull or the hill called Golgotha. And he carried his own, the instrument of his own death, up the hill. In verse 18, we read that he was crucified. They drove the nails through his wrists. They drove the nails through his feet. And like every person who was crucified because Jesus was fully man, he would then have to gasp for breath. He would have to push his, on, on, on his exhausted legs from the climb up the hill, from the beating, he would have to push himself up and take a breath and slump back down. It would cut off his air. Because most people that were crucified died of, of suffocation because they couldn't breathe. When, when their legs cramped or they couldn't push up anymore. And you know, we think about the, the moment when we, had, when we had that one sliver in our finger. And, oh, it hurt so bad and it drove us so crazy. They had 39 times taken all the flesh off his back and now he's on the cross having to push up and breathe and go down again. And, and, all, and all the moments of this, we're on his heart, we're on his mind. Our sins are there and he's realizing, I'm doing it for you. I'm doing it for you. I'm paying the price for you. I'm doing this for you. I'm dying for you. He knew you, he knew your sins, and he loved you enough to do that. In verse 28 of John 19, he says what any of us would have said, I thirst, I'm so thirsty. He's gasping for air, longing for water. And in verse 30 of John 19, we read these words. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Jesus died. The Lord of glory, the maker of heaven and earth, God who walked among us, died. And so I have a question for you tonight. It's not a hypothetical sermon question. It's a deep personal question. What do you say to the one who took all the pain you deserved to offer you his healing power? What do you say to Jesus who took the pain that you would have had to take had you paid for your sins? And I want to invite you to do something. I want to just ask you to quiet your heart and take a moment for prayer just between you and Jesus. And when you think of all that he suffered and all that he went through, the physical torment he went through willingly by his own choice, what would you say to him? And I want to ask you just quietly in your own heart, say it to him now. Lift up to him words of thanks, words of astonishment, words of appreciation. Tell him how you feel about what he did to wash your sins away and the pain he suffered. Talk to Jesus. And then heaped on top of the physical suffering and torment, Jesus knowingly endured emotional agony. He was rejected so you could be received into his heavenly home. Jesus took rejection 
and mocking and exclusion so that we could be included and drawn into his family. And if I were to ask you, if you think through your life, what hurts more and what lasts longer, physical pain or emotional pain? Almost every single person would say, well, the physical pain goes away after an hour or a week. But when someone betrays me, when somebody embarrasses me, when somebody mocks me, that can come back and sting my heart for years or decades. It wasn't just the physical pain that Jesus took. He took our emotional pain that we would have experienced had we had to go through what he went through. And so, so in verse, verses 1 through 3 of John 19, we see these guards and they begin to mock Jesus. Hail, King of the Jews! Hail, King of the Jews! They, they take a, a cloth and they put it over his shoulders. Now remember, he's already been beaten within an inch of his life. And now they put this cloth over his shoulders and they, they, they make this makeshift crown of thorns and they jam it on his head and they begin to hit him on the head with a reed and they begin to mock him. Hail, King of the Jews. Oh, you're the king. Oh, aren't you a wonderful king? They're mocking him. The very one who breathed the universe into existence, the very one who created them, the very one who left the glory of heaven to die for their sins, they are now mocking him. That's not just physical torment, folks. That's an emotional reality. The very one I love and I would give my life for is now mocking me to my face. That's exactly what they did. They mocked him. It's hard to, for us to get our minds around that. I, I had a picture in my mind this week as I was thinking and praying through this sermon about the Queen of England, Elizabeth II. She's 95 years old. I want you to imagine that she left Buckingham Palace or wherever she was without her guard, without her escort, which she wouldn't do, but she kind of started wandering around town. This little 95-year-old lady. She doesn't have a big hat on. She's just wandering around in her common clothes and some street thugs and hoodlums see her and they start mocking her. They throw some stuff. Hey, old lady, hey, old lady. She says, oh, no, no, I'm the queen. Oh, sure you are. They slap her. They kick her. They knock her down. So, well, no one would do that to the queen. Well, we did it to the king of kings, which is worse. If we put it in real human terms, you go, that, that'd be shocking. Could you imagine the tabloids? Could you imagine the news reporting on what happened to Queen Elizabeth II over that? Well, well what do the, the you know, declarations of heaven say when God Almighty who is here among us is mocked and taunted by the very people he came to save? He was rejected by the religious leaders. They cried out, crucify, crucify. What, what is going through the heart of Jesus as he looks at these religious leaders, he's saying, you know the law, you know the prophets. These religious leaders, they knew the Old Testament scriptures better than you or I do. They had memorized massive portions of it, but they missed it. They didn't get it. And so now they look at the one who was the Messiah, the one who came to save them, and they say, crucify him, and they get the crowds to join in. What does that do to the heart of Jesus? These, these are servants of God, so to speak. These are religious leaders. These are people who know the scriptures. And they're demanding the crucifixion of the Messiah. You talk about rejection. Talk about, talk about abandonment at that moment. Jesus watched his family watch him suffer. On the cross, he looks down and sees his mother. And looks in her eyes as she's watching her son be crucified. And all he can think is, she's going to be alone now. So he says, John... Behold your mother, take care of my mom. While he's dying, he watches his mother watch him suffer. It's not just physical suffering Jesus went through. Deep emotional suffering. I can remember like yesterday, even though it's been 35 years, when my wife was in labor with our firstborn son, with Zachariah. And I remember as she was going through her contractions, I was there doing my part, and, uh, which wasn't much, and, and uh, encouraging her and rubbing her back. And, and let me tell you, if any of you are getting ready to have your first child, husbands, if your wife takes your hand while she's going to get into a contraction, make her grab way up here, not on your fingertips, because once the contraction comes, it's like a vice grip, and she will break your fingers or crush them badly. But my wife's going through this incredible pain, and so my wife looks at me, and she sees me watching her suffer. You know what my wife says to me? She, says, she looks at me, and she says, Kevin... I'm so glad it's me going through this and not you. And I said, so am I. I did. And I believe that Jesus looked down from the cross. He said, I'm so glad 
It's me going through this and not you. And if you're a child of God, you said to him, so am I. Because I couldn't bear it, Jesus. I couldn't pay for my sins. I couldn't pay the price. I couldn't carry the weight. I couldn't take the judgment of the Father for all my sins. But Jesus, you did. Jesus said, I'm so glad it's me going through this. That's why he came. To pay the price. To bear our sins. To call us his own. In John 19, we read these words. It was a day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here's your king, Pilate said to the Jews. They shouted, take him away. Take him away. Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. Imagine Jesus hearing these words. We have no king but Caesar. He's their king. The only true king. They denied him. Jesus went through all of this. Physical suffering beyond our comprehension. Emotional, relational turmoil and pain. So just pause and reflect. How much love does it take to endure this kind of rejection and hate from the people you love? How much love do you have to have to put up with that kind of behavior and press on when you could say, Father, angels, this is done. He wouldn't. He didn't. Because he came to give his life. And then Jesus also embraced spiritual torment. It wasn't just physical. It wasn't just emotional. But it was spiritual. He was abandoned so you could be saved. Jesus was abandoned. There wasn't just, there was physical tor torment that we would have had to live with and he took that for us. And there was emotional pain and torment that he took so we wouldn't have to to set us free. But the greatest of all was the spiritual torment reality of what he experienced. He was condemned by people who took the very word of God and twisted it. They called him a blasphemer. He was the Messiah. And the religious leaders took the, took the word of God. He was the, he was the living word of God. They took the written word of God and they twisted and manipulated it to take him to the cross in their minds to condemn him. Again, Jesus offered himself, but they thought they had control over him. The, the spiritual twistedness of that must have broken the heart of Jesus. The religious leaders chose an earthly king, Caesar, over a heavenly king, the Messiah. But then on the cross, in Matthew 27, verse 4, Jesus cried out these words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus cried out while he's on the cross, Daddy, where are you? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you, Father? See, Jesus had been in perfect Trinitarian unity with the Father eternally. And for the first time, he felt a separation because at that moment, our sins were upon him and God who was holy, holy, holy. The Father at that moment somehow in some way was separate from the Son. I, I can't even comprehend it or explain it in a way that makes full sense. But at that moment, Jesus said, Father, where are you? I've been in perfect, constant communion with you and now I feel distant. Why? Because he was taking our sins. That's the cost, now, our separation that would have lasted forever was placed on Jesus at that moment. And he bore it for us. And then in John 19, 30, Jesus said this one word, we translate it into three words in the English, but he said, to tell us die. It's finished. The price is paid. It's over. Matthew 27, 46, we read these words. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He gave up his life. He bore our sins. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, gives these words that I hope you can carry with you in your heart, not just this Good Friday, but every day of your life. It says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Because God is making his appeal to the world through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. 
so that in Jesus Christ, we become the righteousness of God. When Jesus went to the cross, it wasn't the Romans. It wasn't the Jewish establishment. It wasn't you or me. It wasn't Satan himself because no one had power to take his life and lay it down except for Jesus. He knew you. He knew all about you, everything. Even the stuff you've forgotten and even the stuff you wish you couldn't remember. And he said, I will go all the way to the cross and I will lay my life down out of love for you. Jesus, this is our prayer. As we prepare to partake of the bread and the cup, as we remember what you did for us, Jesus, would you meet us in this time? In the quietness of this moment, whether we're at home by ourselves or with others, Lord, this be, let this be a quiet, sacred moment. For anywhere on campus here, outdoors or indoors, Spirit of God, meet with us in this moment. Because we come to partake of the bread and the cup and to remember who you are and what you've done and the greatness of your love. If you're at home, I hope by now you've gathered some bread or some crackers and some kind of juice. If you're here on campus and you didn't get one of the little communion cups, um, our team's going to kind of walk to the front and just kind of raise your hand and they'll make sure they get one for you. If you missed, you got missed on the way in over here, right there, yeah. And make sure you get one of those. And if you have one of those, would you take the side that has the little wafer and just peel that back? And if you're at home, just take the cracker or the bread, whatever you have, and just hold that in your hand. Just hold that wafer in your hand and remember the greatness of God's love. Because at that last supper, in that upper room, sitting with his followers, around the table is Thomas, who's going to deny him. Peter, I mean, Thomas, who's going to doubt him. Peter, who's going to deny him. Judas is going to betray him. They're all around the table. All the other disciples. He takes the bread. And he gives a foreshadow. They don't quite know what it means yet because he hasn't gone to the cross. He's going to soon. But he says, every time you partake of this bread... So do it in remembrance of me. Remember me. So hold the bread in your hand. And look at it and feel it between your fingers. It's a physical reminder of a spiritual reality. He could have called the angels. He didn't. His body was broken. Just leaving heaven and taking a body was enough but under the whip and under the cross because of the nails he took the physical punishment that we deserved so remember Jesus remember that he left the glory of heaven took on flesh remember that he lived a life with no sin but willingly by his own choice died for your sins he was broken to make you whole As you partake of this bread, remember the price that Jesus paid for you. Let's partake of the bread together. At that table, Jesus took the cup. He said to them, this cup is a new covenant and my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He said, every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. If you're at home, take whatever you have in the cup there. And if you're here on campus, take that, peel off the side, just take, hold in your hands that cup and look at the juice. It's a reminder, it's a picture that Jesus gave for us that his blood was shed we remember that Jesus allowed his body to be broken his blood to be shed the book of Hebrews says that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins there's a price that's to be paid and either we pay it or he does and in this cup we remember that he paid the price by his choice 
you in mind. So partake of the cup and remember the price that Jesus paid for you. Lord Jesus, in the quietness of this moment, speak to our hearts. Speak your love to us. Too often we hear the voice of the enemy whispering, you don't deserve it. And we're reminded tonight that we don't have your grace, O oh God, through Jesus because we deserve it. We have it because Jesus gave it. And we have accepted the gift. Take these moments as the worship team leads us in this song. And with thankful hearts, just, just speak to him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for the price you paid. Thank you that you did not say, Father, angels. You said, put the sword away. I'm going to the cross. Thank him that from the cross, he cared more about you than he cared about himself. During this song, uses it as a chance to pray and thank God for his goodness in your life.